What's up, guys? I'm back with another podcast episode. Again, Will is out of town. That guy has been an absolute world traveler this year. And you've maybe heard me say this before, but I always have to laugh with how much Will is out of town these days. Because like six months ago, Will was like, man, I really don't want to do that much travel. And now the guy is like gone way more than I am. So it's just kind of funny. But yeah, Will is in Hawaii. So we've got another solo podcast episode this week. And we're going to be talking about paddle clones on the market. We have a Q&A. The PPA recently copyright striked my gold medal match from that tournament, which is hilarious, and just a variety of other smaller topics that you guys have been asking me about and I thought would be worth covering in this video. If you're watching the video on YouTube, uh, you are going to see me looking at my phone for my notes just because it's a little easier when I can double check my notes on some of these topics. So the first thing I want to talk about is just paddle clones in the market and people's obsession with the fact that you can buy paddles for $20 from the factory. There's a lot of things that are really interesting about this. So I feel like earlier this year when people kind of figured out, oh, hey, I can go to Alibaba and I can buy a paddle in theory for $20, it just started this whole interesting like mess in the paddle market. I feel like I see everywhere that people are like, oh, why are companies selling a paddle for 180, 200, 220 when it only costs them 20 bucks? That markup is absolutely ridiculous. And while I do think that markup is really high, I think when you actually look into running a business, it's not that ridiculous. Like I don't think a lot of these companies are raking in as much money as most people think. For example, if I just go through my list of things here, if you're running one of these businesses, now of course, it depends on the scale of your business. If you look at someone like a Selkirk or a Yola, these are going to scale way further than anything I have on this list. The ones I'm looking at here are probably just a small to even maybe mid-sized company. But you would have tariffs from China, so importing your package, you've now lost some money doing that. Uh, you have customer service employees that you need to pay, a warehouse lease, shipping, taxes. Taxes is always a good portion of every single one's or every single person's money. USAP approval costs per paddle. I believe that's around fifteen hundred dollars or somewhere in that ballpark. If you want to create a new mold, I think I've also heard those are between fifteen hundred and twenty five hundred dollars. So if you don't want something in the catalog going to cost you money to do that. And now if you're going to prototype a bunch of paddles, those molds are going to get expensive pretty quick. You have ads and then you also have ambassador payouts. And this is a big one that I don't think people think about. Customers very frequently with almost every company minus maybe a few exceptions from the really big companies, the customer gets 10% off with a code like code PB studio. And then the ambassador like me also gets 10%. So right off the top of there, from any of your margins, you're losing 20% the vast majority of the time, because I'm sure most paddles being bought with a lot of these companies are being bought with a code. So goodbye 20%, and then taxes, let's just be conservative and say it's 15%. Then you've also got tariffs on your packages, and now you're paying employees. So I think when you really look at everything that entails running a business, and I'm sure there are so many other things that I didn't even think about in this calculation. It really isn't company A is selling paddles for $200, but it only costs them 20 bucks. Now, there are definitely some companies where I think it is pretty ridiculous, the price they're charging, where you can tell it is absolutely a paddle off a catalog, and then they just slapped their name on it and tried to ship it for 200 bucks. The companies that try and do that in this day and age, honestly think that's ridiculous. They can try and fluff it up with marketing all they want, but still not great. But all that to say, I don't think a lot of the companies are raking in the profit that people expect them to. And then also, if you have companies that do true R&D, that's also going to add up over time, which I think we all want from companies. We wanna see more innovation. And I think if we want to not see people just pushing stuff out of a catalog that may lead to higher priced items. So even when you've got a paddle that's around $100, if you factor in 10% payment to an ambassador and 10% discount code for a customer, okay, 
that paddle is now $80. And if it costs them 20 bucks, we'll say just for easy math, now they are profiting $60. Now you add in tariffs, paying employees, everything else I've already talked about, you're not profiting very much on a $100 paddle. I think a lot of people just look at it and they go, $20 paddle, $100 price, 5X markup. Oh my gosh, they're raking in money. And I just really don't think it works that way. So I don't know, that was just something that was kind of on my mind lately. Now, while I don't wanna see pickleball paddles just go through the roof in price, I do think there's more to the story than what a lot of the people on the internet are claiming right now. And I just, I don't know, I just thought it was interesting to share because it's been on my mind lately. But anyways, moving on, the other thing I wanna talk about along with clones is just, I get messages all the time about like, hey Chris, I just started getting ads from this paddle company. Can you please review them? And most of the time I will go and look at them if I haven't already heard about them. And a ton of the companies that I have gotten messaged recently, they tend to have very nice websites. Their marketing looks very nice. Uh, honestly, a step above even some of the ones I've been seeing uh, in recent years. But if you look at the specs, it's just a generic paddle. And even if your paddle is $100 for a raw carbon fiber paddle, that's almost not good enough anymore. So for example, Vatic has established themselves as like the king of a $100 paddle. The Prism is such a good paddle. So if you come in at $100 and maybe your marketing is a little bit more flashy, it's like, okay, well, if your paddle is just the same as the Prism, why am I gonna go buy that, right? We already trust Vatic, so what is the reason for me to come over and look at this? And there's just been so many of these recently, and I guess I'm saying all of this to basically say, guys, just be careful with a lot of the marketing out there. Because a lot of these come from some of the same factories, and a lot of these people are just getting into it because, hey, it's easy to go get some paddles made and make some money, you're gonna see a lot of paddles that are similar to something else, then I don't I don't even know how I wanna say it, guys, but basically it's just, there's a lot of similar paddles out there and I just wouldn't fall for the marketing. And, and that's not to say that the companies are even being malicious, but it's just, I wouldn't go get too excited about a paddle and think it's gonna be the next thing since sliced bread when it's a very high likelihood that it's not anything special at all. So I would just say, guys, when you see one of these pop up, if you wanna try it, go for it. It's highly unlikely that the paddle is going to be bad. When something is a clone or just something out of a catalog, a lot of times these days, that doesn't mean the paddle's gonna be bad. But if I have the option between, hey, there's this brand new company that we know almost nothing about and they have some specs that are similar to a company I do know and trust, I'm probably just gonna go with the company I do know and trust unless this new company offers like an insane warranty, uh, an insane return policy, or maybe they are claiming that something is really different about their paddles. But most of the time, guys, you can just look at the specs and unless they claim something very, very specific is different about their paddles, then it's probably just not going to be anything special. So yeah, those are just some thoughts on the paddle market right now in terms of the clones. There's a lot of companies that are just racing to $100. There's so many more of them and they're popping up all the time. And I, again, I don't really think it's a bad thing. The consumer gets a lot more options at reasonable prices, but just don't expect a lot of people to be reviewing these paddles because I think especially as some of the other reviewers in this space, review more and more paddles, you just get to a point where it's like, okay, well, why am I gonna review this other $100 paddle that on paper is the same as this one? Like, I would rather serve more people by reviewing this thing that uh, is different, unique, or more people are asking about than, hey, let me just review another $100 paddle. Like, I don't know. So this kind of turned into like a little mini rant, but. I just wanted to share some thoughts and perspective on some of it because I think the pricing is not really what people think it is. And then also just wanted to share some thoughts on seeing a lot of just cheaper clone paddles hit the market as of lately with a fancy paint job and some marketing. Uh, anyways, the next thing I wanted to talk about was the PPA. So I posted my gold medal match. And first of all, I'm not going to lie, guys, I had a very very fun time reading the comments because 
I have not really posted any raw gameplay on my channel before, so I've never had to deal with the comments of people saying, huh, there's no way this is blank level. In my state, this would be this level. And I think you guys know if you've been in pickleball, this is like the most common gold standard comment you will see on any gameplay video. Honestly, go look it up. Go look up like 4-0 gameplay amateur on YouTube for pickleball. And I can, I'd almost bet you money that in the comments, someone will say, this isn't 4-0, this is 3-0 in my state. This looks really easy. So I just thought it was super funny seeing some of those comments because I'm like, we're at a gold medal match, which usually brings in some of the highest level players to these tournaments. In fact, you usually bring in some sandbaggers. We get to the gold medal match and people are like, nah, man, this is, this is 3-0 or 3-5. So I just thought that was super funny. But anyways, I just want to say thanks to everyone who watched that video. The video has been performing really well. Honestly, I was surprised that so many people wanted to just watch raw gameplay because for me, I honestly don't really watch that type of content. So I was kind of surprised that so many people wanted to watch this one. So maybe I'll do more of that in the future with other types of gameplay. But the main reason I wanted to bring this up was because I woke up this morning and saw there was a copyright strike or copyright claim on the video and I was confused because like there's no music in the video so why is it getting a copyright claim? And then I found out one of the companies that the PPA is partnered with possibly which is the sports video group I believe or SVG company is partnered with a PPA and they claimed my video so now all the monetization will go to them. So while I this probably isn't really the PPA's fault. I don't think anyone over there probably even saw the video. They probably didn't go out and claim this video. I do just think it's ridiculous that this video got claimed. This video wasn't on center court. There's not a pro within a mile of this facility because it was like 10 p.m. when this match was happening. The biggest thing there is that there was probably a banner in the background that had like DraftKings or PPA on it. So I'm just sitting there going, why on earth is this getting claimed? And it just kind of annoying because it's like, okay, maybe the PPA like really honestly doesn't care because they really only seem to be focused on the pros, but you guys don't even want to see amateur games from your tournament. You know, the thing that makes you money and people probably want to share with their friends. So I just thought it was weird that there was a claim on the video and I honestly just think it's annoying and hopefully it's something that the PPA will actually look into and prevent from happening in the future because if you're not going to allow any gameplay from your tournaments and now with having lost a lot of your pros, I'm like, I don't know, maybe the amateur should just go play APP or something where you're actually allowed to do what seems to be anything, at least in terms of recording your own amateur matches. So yeah, just a really bizarre and kind of annoying thing to wake up to. Hopefully it'll get resolved. I submitted a dispute on it, kind of explaining my side of the story, but I just thought it was fascinating. The video still stays up. It's just that all the revenue would now go to them instead of me, which is just a little bit annoying. So We'll see what happens, but just be aware of that, I guess, if you're another content creator out there. All right, I also just wanted to give some quick thoughts on the Slinger Pickleball Machine. A lot of you have actually been asking me how that's been going for me, and I just had some quick thoughts that I wanted to share on it. So I've gotten to use a Tudor Plus a Slinger and a Lobster. The Lobster was a long time ago, so it has been a minute, so anything I say about that, take it with a grain of salt, because it was only a few sessions with it, didn't get to use it extensively. But so far, the Slinger is the best pickleball bag or machine that I have used for several reasons. One, the price is highly appealing. For 900 bucks and getting like an all-in-one solution, I think that's really nice because one of my biggest gripes with the Tudor was one, it was super annoying to transport. It was kind of awkward to carry and to roll it around on the wheels, there was no extendable handle. So a lot of times your body was slumped over towards the machine so that the machine could still make contact with the ground and then drag it around. Not to mention the wheels on it are also really small. So if you're going over any bumps, that just feels absolutely terrible. And then again, not to mention the balls can't be contained in the machine. So you need another separate bag for your balls. And then you also need something to pick up all the balls separately. So it's just a pain to travel with. And to me, the biggest thing about a ball machine is that it needs to be convenient because 
if it is a pain to put in my car, a pain to bring in my house, and a pain to get on the court, I'm probably just not going to use it. The more friction there is with actually just using the machine, the less likely I'm gonna wanna use it. And that's one of the reasons I ended up looking into the Slinger was because it's all about convenience. It can, It's big enough. Now, granted, it's probably double or maybe two and a half times the size vertically of a Tudor, so it is noticeably bigger, but the wheels are way bigger, so it rolls really nicely. There's an extendable handle, so it's really nice to roll around. It can hold the ball tube inside of the machine. There's a huge pocket for it. Um, you also have the remote, which the range on mine kind of sucks. I need to check if the, the battery on that is low. Um, you can also charge your phone from the Slinger, I believe. I haven't had to use that yet, but that's kind of just a cool, handy feature if you want to use it. Um, I'm trying to think what else, but so far, it's just been a very convenient machine. In fact, I would probably, without having tried some of the other ones, I think I can pretty confidently say it's the most convenient machine in pickleball because all the balls are also stored securely inside of the machine. There's just a big zipper pocket. You unzip it, you can put the balls in, you can zip it up. And now when I load this into my car, I just pick up the machine, put it in there. I don't need to carry a bag of balls from my house. I don't need to carry the machine and a ball tube and whatever else, super convenient. And then you throw in the fact that the thing is $900 versus almost 2000 for some of these other machines. I really think it's a solid machine. Now, the one thing I will say about ball machines in general is they are great if there's a shot you really want a ton of repetition on. So for example, if you wanted to do a ton of drives, a ton of drops, or maybe even a ton of roll volleys at the net, I think it's great for that. But there are other things where a ball machine just can't replace a human. If I want to do a lot of dinking, or if I want to practice hand battles, or I want to practice resets, I think those are all way better with an actual person. And now, I don't think a ball machine was ever meant to replace a person, but there are still times where using the ball machine, I have kind of just gone, huh. I really wish I just had a person for this. For, for example, one of my favorite drills is mid-court resets. So one person's in the middle of the court, other person's at the net, and they're just gonna hammer overheads at you or hammer rolls at you, and you just have to reset the ball. Doing that with a person, the ball comes at different speeds, it comes at different heights, it comes at different locations. If you wanted to do that with a ball machine, you would need to somehow elevate it way up so that you can shoot the ball down, and now it's only gonna shoot at the same speed in the same location. So that to me is not very helpful if you wanna practice resets and same things, same thing with hands battles. You know, if you're doing that with a person, it's gonna to go to different locations, different speeds. Can't mimic that with a ball machine. So for certain things that you really wanna repeat a lot, it's awesome. When I did my 15,000 backhands, the ball machine was so valuable for that. Cause I can tell you right now, none of my brothers or any of my friends are gonna to wanna to feed me 15,000 backhands over two weeks. So the ball machine was absolutely amazing for that, and I'm getting ready to work uh, more on my backhand roll, and I'm sure it's gonna be awesome for that. But if you're buying a ball machine because you want it to replace a human entirely, really don't think it's gonna work for that. So do think about that when you're gonna drop this much money on a machine, is that there is a chance that you may just wanna hit with people. I don't really have any shortage of drill partners, so the ball machine gets used when I wanna do something that I know a human isn't gonna to wanna to help with, but otherwise I'd rather use a human. So anyways, all that to say guys, the Slinger has been great so far. The battery life is awesome. I really don't have many complaints about the machine. There's still some things I need to test with it, but overall I think price and value for that machine is through the roof. I would not buy a Tudor instead of uh, the Slinger. I probably wouldn't even buy a Lobster instead of the Slinger as well. The only ones that I would consider outside of the Slinger would be something like the Ernie or the Spin Shot where they have those programmable drills inside of the machine where it can kind of shoot the ball to a designated location. I think that is a unique feature that those have over something like the Slinger. But I haven't used those, so I still, you know, convenience, again. If I don't want to bring it from my house to my car and actually use the thing, it doesn't matter how nice those features are, and those definitely look less convenient than the Slinger. So 
There you guys go. Those are some thoughts on the Slinger Ball Machine. Okay, next up, I went to Instagram and put out a poll and just asked you guys for some questions for this pod just to do a Q&A. So we're gonna go ahead and hop into those now. The first one is someone asked, what are the new RPMs on Zane's paddle? So I did get to test this. I just haven't had time to make an actual video on it. And to be honest, I don't even know if it's worth the time to make an entire video on, but I ran the test twice. And both times I got around the 1800 range for Zane's new paddle. And I even had my brother do it and he got around 1900. So he was just a little bit higher than me, but that's also normal. He tends to generate a little bit more topspin than I do. What was interesting about this is it's definitely different from the first Pro XR that I received. When you put it under the microscope and I'll put some pictures up, the grit is entirely different. In fact, it looks a lot different than how most raw carbon fiber paddles I've seen R, and actually I've never seen one look like this Pro XR. So either this was an accident or they're doing something a little bit different with their paddle. More than likely they found an interesting way to basically work with the peel ply texture. So in my specific case, I didn't get a result that was insane. Honestly, I thought the numbers were gonna be 2300 plus based on the things I've been hearing pros say about it. But maybe this is just one of those paddles that like, only a pro can take full advantage of, right? Like maybe I don't have the mechanics. Well, obviously I don't have the mechanics that these pros have, but maybe something about their mechanics allows them to take advantage of the grit on this paddle more and get even more spin with it than say me. Now it's a good bump from the original Zane paddle that I hit. That one was in the 1600s. Now it's 1800 to 1900. Or maybe the one I got is just a dud. Maybe it's less gritty. That happens all the time. I get ones from companies that are just way below what they would probably prefer. So I don't really know what the deal is. Those are some of my thoughts and theories on it. It wasn't as insane as I was expecting, but I'm sure these pros aren't complaining for no reason. So I'm sure the thing is good, but in the results I got, I wasn't seeing anything super insane. We even played a couple singles games with it and there was nothing about it that felt busted or broken relative to other paddles that I have hit on the court. So I don't know, take it for what it's worth to you. The next question I get, and this is actually one I get all the time is where should I place lead tape on X paddle? Maybe it's the Ron Nova, maybe it's a prism, maybe it's a double black diamond, pro line energy, whatever it is. And this is always a really hard question to answer guys, because there is no definitive place that you should put lead tape on your paddle because lead tape is a very, very personal thing to each individual. For example, my younger brother loves to put lead on the head of his bread and butter fill. I think that's actually insane. There's no way the swing weight needs to be even higher for me, and I don't even think it needs that much more power. So adding all that lead to the head to me is wild. If I was gonna put lead anywhere on that paddle, it would be the throat. Now, Will, on the other hand, a lot of times he likes to put his lead at three and nine, which is about halfway up the paddle, and I don't mind doing that, but there's a lot of times where that's just not really ideal for me. So I say all of that just to say that it's different for everyone. At the end of the day, you really have to experiment with what works for you. And lead tape is cheap enough that I would recommend just put some on, play with it. If you don't like it, take it off. And that's actually why I really like the pre-cut lead tape strips that are just three grams each because I can peel off the backing, throw it exactly where I want on my paddle. I know how much weight it is. It's super consistent. I don't need scissors. I don't need a scale, none of that. So I would highly recommend those strips and I'll try to remember to link that down in the description. If I forget, feel free to yell at me and I'll make sure to put it in there. But yeah, just be aware that it's gonna be different for everyone. So there is no best lead tape set up. And a lot of times when people ask, I can't really give a good recommendation because I actually don't know what type of player you are. So that's why you should just experiment with it, find out what you generally like. Maybe you really like head heavy paddles. I personally don't. So that's why I often put lead at the throat and occasionally three and nine, but still not that often. Next up, do you ever play APP events? I actually haven't since last year and it's not because I don't like them. I actually really wanted to go to the Chicago one this year, but with the Kansas tournament being the week before, it was just a little too much travel for me. So I decided not to do it. Uh, hopefully I can make it to one either this year or at a minimum next year. Um, to be honest, 
I probably wouldn't mind playing him because one, the APP probably won't copyright strike me for posting one of my amateur matches from their tournament. So that sure would be appealing. But the biggest reason is just in the past, there have been more of the top level pros at the PPA events. So it's easier to network. Um, I'm closer to some of those events. So there really hasn't been any specific reason. It's just been, there's more people I know going to PPA events. Have you been close to switching away from the double black diamond and which paddles were close? I wouldn't really say I've been close. Honestly, the double black diamond is just always what I go back to. If I'm gonna go to a tournament, that's what I wanna pick up. However, the closest ones have probably been the Vatic Prism Flash, but I still just don't think the Prism Flash has enough power for me to fully want to commit to it. And then the other one was the Valer Forza Mach 1 16 millimeter, which honestly shouldn't be a surprise. I really liked the Ronbus R1 Pulsar, and those paddles are unbelievably similar. The main reason, if I'm gonna be completely honest, that I ended up preferring the Forza over uh, the Ronbus, and this is how I know I've been hanging around Will too much, it's purely because of how the thing looked. The Forza just looks so good with that blue gradient, and the Ronbus is just black with like a rhombus logo on it so it's not really even that it performs so much better than a rhombus it's just it looks nicer and if all things are even and one looks nicer i'm gonna take that one but i do think that's a good paddle and that shouldn't be too much of a surprise because it's pretty similar to a double black diamond but the power is toned down a bit but i did compete in a small local tournament with that and i did like the paddle quite a bit so i would say those have been the closest ones but yeah, I always go back to the double black diamond. It's just a really good paddle. Next up is what are the best paddles for tennis elbow? And this one is difficult to answer because tennis elbow can be caused for by so many different things. It can be a lack of strength in your arm. It can be uh, the grip is too small It could because you're squeezing it too tightly. It could be because the paddle is too head heavy. It's really hard to narrow down exactly what it is for most people. And I think for, or, or it could also just be technique. Sometimes people's technique is really wonky and it's hurting their arm. So it's tough to give recommendations because one, there aren't many paddles that can actually claim they help tennis elbow. There's very few of those. In fact, the only one that might have any reasonable, even remotely close to true claim would be Pro Kenix. A lot of people have hit those, say it really helps their tennis elbow. So that would be the only brand I could actually recommend and feel any reasonable confidence that it would help with tennis elbow. But more than likely, if you have really bad tennis elbow or chronic tennis elbow, I'd be looking into strengthening your arm or I would just be looking into fixing your technique because the paddle is really only going to be a band-aid. It's not going to be the end all solution. It might help, but it will still come back if you go to any other paddle after that. So just keep that in mind. Next, someone asked, do you still get tournament jitters? And if so, how do you deal with it? And yes, I do. Maybe not as badly as my first one, but this last PPA, I was pretty nervous in the first match we played. But I think that it was largely due to Zane, Christian, Pablo, and Federico being right next to us with no barrier between us. So I was more concerned about the ball rolling onto their court and them getting annoyed by it. I don't even really know that it had to do with my match. But I would say there are still matches, usually the first one of the day, where I'm a little more shaky. And I think the biggest thing for me is I just have to tell myself, like, you just got to go for it. If you play timid or you play really shaky, like, you're going to play worse. Uh, so you just have to tell yourself, like, look, I'm here to play. I want to leave everything on the court. I don't want to walk off this court and be like, man, if only I had tried this or if only I normally played how I normally do. You just got to go and actually do it. Um, but for me, if I am having a hard time shaking those nerves taking a timeout, getting a drink of water, and just like breathing a little bit tends to help me. But really, the more tournaments you play, the more this will go away. If you could go back in time, what would you train about your training or skill improvement? Well, I probably would not have gotten into content creation because then I could actually <laughs> sit and practice the game instead of uh, reviewing paddles all the time. But no, jokes aside, I don't really know what I would go back and change, to be honest. I've been pretty happy with my skill improvement so far. I mean, really, the only thing I wish is that I just had more time to actually go and drill and commit to that so that I could improve even faster. But beyond that, I've been really content with my journey so far. Maybe I would have emphasized certain skills more, um, like 
in the early days, probably focusing on my hands more just because I feel like that is a skill that no matter what, you're always going to need it in pickleball and it's really useful to have, whether it's counters, punches, blocks, whatever, just hands, period. Hands, hands, hands is probably the thing I would have trained more in the early days. Next up, someone asked, what are your thoughts on paddles only lasting three to six months? Now, this one's an interesting one because I actually have quite a few thoughts on this. So first of all, a lot of people are like, oh, paddle only lasts three to six months. It largely depends on the type of player you are. If you play four, five days a week, it's very possible that that paddle will only last you that long. But it also just depends on your tolerance level for how much performance you can lose, I guess, from your paddle and still be happy. For example, I would say most three, five players out there could use the same paddle for a very long time and not really notice any difference. There's so many things in your game that you actually need to work on and focus on that I don't know that you're gonna notice that you lost 300 RPM. You're not generating that much insane topspin on every single one of your shots, so it's not something that I really think you need to be concerned about. Now, as you move up the ladder and certain shots rely on you know more spin or whatever, yes, you probably will notice it. And now I'm not saying a 3.5 can't notice these things. They obviously can. But what I am trying to say is that at that level, it's a lot more basic dinking. It's a lot more banging. Points aren't uh, super well constructed. So I don't think that the paddle having slightly less pop or a little less spin is usually going to hurt you as much as it will at the higher level. So if you're someone who can tolerate losing some performance, your paddle could go way over a year. I know some of the people who have been using the same Vanguard paddle for forever, or even just like a gearbox for forever, and they're completely content with it, even though I'm sure it's lost some performance compared to when it was new. Now, the other side of this is a lot of people are like, uh, you know, grit needs to last longer, and I think we all want that, right? Like, I would love to see a paddle that has grit that lasts a year or more. But I think with the materials we're using right now, that's just not going to be possible. Or it's just not gonna last forever. Like it's all dependent on how much you play. If you drill two times a day, you do that five times a week, I don't care what paddle it is. That grit is gonna wear off and it's gonna wear off quickly compared to someone who does substantially less play than you, especially if it's at a lower level. I think realistically what's gonna have to happen is at some point, Pickleball is gonna need the replaceable face sheets where you can just reapply your grit. I think it's gonna be just like tennis or just like table tennis where your strings go bad or your rubber goes bad and you just replace it because I really don't think we're gonna find a material that lasts forever. Tennis strings don't last forever and table tennis rubber doesn't last forever. So I don't really know why we expect grit in pickleball to last forever. I think right now it is an annoying issue we have to deal with, but my thought is that's just where we are right now. Like I've been using the same double black diamond for four, maybe coming up on five months now and has it lost some grit? Yeah, but do I still use it in tournaments? Yes, and I have the option of using any paddle I want. So. I don't know, sometimes I just think it's not as big of a deal as people make it. Um, you know, I want to see the market get better and have paddles that last longer. If we could get to a year plus, that would be incredible. But I think right now I've just come to the conclusion, this is where we're at right now. It's annoying. I think it'll get better in the future, but we're just not there yet. All right, so those were the questions I had from Instagram. Thank you to everyone who submitted a question. I really appreciate it. Hopefully, Will will be done with his worldwide traveling soon, and you guys won't have to deal with a solo podcast anymore, but I do appreciate everyone who tunes into all these episodes. So thank you so much for listening, and I'll catch you in the next one.